Hello and welcome to our live stream. Hello and welcome to our live stream. For the next two hours, we will be showcasing some of the senior captains of our class. Obviously, because of COVID, we can't have a physical show. And because of this, today's event has become largely student-led. And we, the class of 2020, are excited to have you here with us tonight. Thank you to the faculty for teaching us all we have learned through our education for the last three years. We would not be the designers we are today without you. Throughout our college career, we've developed insights to approach problem solving with consideration. We've learned valuable skills as well as life lessons, everything from designing a font to a backpack, as well as how to take constructive criticism in design and in life. Thank you for pushing us to our full potential. And thank you to the class of 2020. I think I can speak for all of us in saying the greatest resource we have gained is each other. During this live stream, we will be collecting donations for the Black Artists and Designers Guild an organization that strives to combat the lack of representation of black talent and culture in the design industry. Our goal for the end of the night is to raise $5,000 for this organization, but our GoFundMe will extend until Friday evening. The link to the GoFundMe is in the description below. As designers, we are natural advocates for change. We are problem solvers. From the start of our education, we have come to learn how it's our responsibility to use this platform as creative individuals to seek innovation, never settle for less, and to push against complacency. To offer a brief overview of this evening's event, please join us in eight minutes and 46 seconds of silence in remembrance of George Floyd. We'll then jump into the capstone presentations to showcase the incredible projects our peers have been working on throughout the quarter, which will be split up by two breaks. During the breaks, there will be various petitions, donation funds, and educational materials to amplify black voices and to provide resources in order to enact change. The order of these presentations is detailed in the description below. Feel free to participate by leaving comments in the comment section. Enjoy the show.
Greetings, alumni and friends of the Division of Design. Welcome to the first ever virtual student showcase. We're pleased you can join us this evening. These students have worked extremely hard under difficult conditions. The school has been closed for access since the end of winter quarter. So these projects you will see today have been completed from their homes, miles, or even time zones away from UW. Our classes have been online in all quarter. Thank you, Zoom. These students have juggled multiple projects, software programs, and final senior show production while still maintaining a connection, even though they're miles apart. It's great to see how all projects have come together despite the new online landscape, but that's the power of design. We've been amazed and impressed by the empathy, flexibility, and resilience of these students. We wanna thank you, the alumni, for giving so generously of your time over the past few weeks. It has truly been extraordinary to have so many of you giving critique. This has been one of the few upsides of the pandemic and we hope to continue to engage you in the future, even when our classes resume in person. I think our alumni will be interested in this piece of news. We would like to recognize Chris Azupko, who is retiring after 39 years at the UW. We have prepared a short five minute video for this occasion. This year is special because it also marks the graduation, if you will, of Professor Christopher Azupko. Chris has been at the University of Washington for 39 years, and after this spring quarter, he will retire. Chris is originally from Canada, our fine neighbor to the north. He came to UW in 1981 after receiving his MFA from Cranbrook Academy of Art in Michigan. Cranbrook was a highly influential program at that time, and Chris was there during what is now called the McCoy era, when Catherine McCoy and her husband, Michael McCoy, essentially redefined the field of design after modernism. Chris's work is shown at right. This is from the 1990 book, Cranbrook Design, The New Design Discourse. Professor Doug Guadin has often told me that he was largely responsible for hiring Chris. This is a wonderful photograph of Chris and Doug at the UW Faculty Club. Chris has some great stories of his faculty interview with Doug. Professor Christine Matthews was an undergraduate student in the UW design program in the late 80s and provided these photographs from her senior year. On the right, you see Chris with Judy Anderson, who was a professor at UW in the design program from 1988 through 2002. But this is a photograph from 1997, which was my own first year at the UW. So Chris and I have worked together for 23 years. At the UW, Chris was director of the School of Art for 18 years, from 1996 through 2014. Chris guided our unit through some very difficult times. There was the 2000 dot-com recession and the financial crisis of 2007 through 2010. These were very challenging times for both the university and the School of Art. In the Division of Design, one of Chris's major contributions was connecting the program to influences outside the Pacific Northwest. For example, Chris organized and hosted the legendary designer Wolfgang Weingart at UW, who you see here. This included a lecture at UW relating to Weingart's book, My Way to Typography and an amazing exhibit of Weingart's posters at the Jacob Lawrence Gallery. Chris also invited the independent Swiss publisher Lars Mueller to UW. He organized an exhibit of Mueller's beautiful books at the Jacob Lawrence Gallery. Chris also hosted the husband-wife design duo Studio Cyan at UW. They have an unusual ethereal aesthetic that stems in part from their experiences in East Berlin. Both Cyan and the Dutch poster designer Ralph Schreivogel conducted poster design workshops for our UW students in the 2000s. I think this was a remarkable experience for students. More recently, Chris has turned his attention to China. I was delighted when Chris asked me to work with him on a student design collaboration between UW and Southeast University in Nanjing, China. But of course, Chris's most lasting international venture has been the UW Design in Rome program. 
For many summers, Chris and his wife Susan have taken groups of UW design students to Italy in August. In Rome, students explore both typography and photography, resulting in a series of beautiful handmade books. I do not envy Chris and Susan as they have managed 20-some students around the narrow streets of Rome in hot summer weather. But when the students return, they rave about the transformative experiences they have had. This is not our final goodbye to Chris. Next spring in 2021, one year from now, Chris will give a comprehensive lecture about his work as both a designer and educator. At that time, we will hopefully be able to meet in person on the UW campus. Until then, best wishes to Chris for a wonderful summer. And Chris, thank you for all you have done for the UW and for the Division of Design. What you're about to watch is a selection of short videos from some of the seniors. And as you know, the design showcase can't be in the Jake Gallery this year, but we encourage you to follow the students on their Instagram at UW Design and also look out for the website, uwdesignshow.com, launching this Friday. Enjoy. Yay! Congratulations! Yay! Congrats! That's Woo -hoo! Woo -hoo! <laughs> Passion Fruit is a coalition of designers who are emphasizing the importance of practicing curiosity through creative means during unprecedented times. We are seeking resilience through crafts, persisting to create during a crisis, and setting a foundation for our entire creative career to never stop learning, creating, or exploring. Passion fruit derives from the persistence to bear fruit without the stability of our physical space, friends, and design community. We're practicing what we hope to carry on now and after graduation, which is honing the ability to remain curious. Our products were all handmade by the practice of a new or familiar skill. We have eight designers who are participating in Passion Fruit. Each participant created their own products based off of various prompts we use that correspond to our philosophy as creative individuals. These prompts are, how do you stay creative outside the studio? How do you confront uncertainty? How can we use creativity to foster connection? Passion Fruit currently takes form as an online pop-up shop, but in the future, it could change. It encourages opportunities for design students to explore new or familiar materials, learn what it's like to sell work, see how individuals respond to the result of a project, and most importantly, organize a creative community to unite over a common cause. Our hope is that Passion Fruit furthers opportunities for design students to sell their work during the design showcase. We believe offering this opportunity could allow students to learn what it's like to manage a business and see how our other individuals respond to their physical work. As an ode to the philosophy behind Passion Fruit, we are donating a percentage of our proceeds to Black activist organizations. It is crucial that we speak openly about the injustices towards our Black community members, friends, and loved ones using what privileges we have to do everything we can to defend and amplify their voices. Passion Fruit will launch Friday in correspondence to the UW Design Showcase. We hope to see you all then. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah and I'm sharing with you today the research report I made about UW Design Health and Wellbeing. The report is targeted towards the faculty and admin of the UW Design program and aims to form a portrait of the student's experience with health and well-being and identifies recommendations to better support students. I decided to work on this project because through personal experience, I felt how being a design student took a toll on my health and well-being, and by talking to some of my peers in the program, many of them felt a similar way. So to create some kind of change, the first step was to research the problem space and to communicate the findings. The support also touches on the larger problem area of the academic and work-related stress and burnout among young adults around the world. For my research, I talked to UW Design students and alumni to learn more about what their experience with health and well-being is like. I also sent out a survey to gain a quantitative perspective. I also conducted a round of research where I asked students and alumni to ideate specifically around recommendations that would go into the report through virtual ideation sessions. There are six chapters total in this report, so I'll be taking you through one example chapter and sharing some details about the design. Each chapter represents a main research theme and is introduced by a cover page. 
As you flip into each chapter, you can begin to read the insights. The overarching insights are broken down into smaller, more detailed descriptions with supporting quotes from students and alumni. This is the main way the research findings are communicated throughout the report. The report also includes data visualizations based on survey data. This data viz is used to support and further illustrate the qualitative data. Throughout the report, space is used to highlight certain quotes and introduce some breathing moments and visual breaks from the content. Lastly, each chapter has a recommendation page or two at the end that shows suggestions for how the faculty and admin can address the health and well-being issues that were brought up during the chapter. Almost all of these recommendations were chosen based on things that were brought up by students and alumni. Underneath each recommendation are ideas for how to achieve the effect of that recommendation. Each of these pages includes a section on what the program is doing well so that faculty and admin can know what students currently find valuable so that they can build off of it. The impact that I'm hoping for this report to make is to help improve student health and well-being in the long run and that small changes will start to be made to address some of the issues that are brought up in the report, all the while maintaining all the great things about the program. More broadly, I also hope that the report can be a topic of conversation for years to come and that faculty, admin, and also the students themselves can continue to think, talk about, and to prioritize health and well-being. Additionally, the report has the potential to be applied to other similar programs that are also competitive and professional oriented. You can view, download, and comment on the report in its entirety at this link. Feel free to reach out to my email as well. Thank you everyone for listening and please remember to take care of yourself during this time. Hi, I'm Eli. And I'm Eric. And this is our capstone project. This is a collaboration between VCD and ID that we are calling variable objects. America is facing many challenges right now, and we want to acknowledge that this project is addressing one a lot farther down on the list. Recognizing that, we began this project by looking at some growing issues in and around the housing market in America. We've identified a trend that apartment square footage is shrinking while the cost of rent is rising. Millennials are a generation of renters, with three out of four currently in rented living situations. Furniture attributes to a massive amount of waste in America. In fact, more than 27 times the weight of the Empire State Building and furniture waste is accumulated annually. And that brings us to our goal, to design a furniture brand as a kit of parts focused on aspects of interchangeability, abstracting the purpose of furniture, and retaining the potential for deconstruction and evolution. We are catering to apartment renters with limited space, a younger generation who moves around more often, and those carrying an interest in utility and maker culture. We began this project at the onset of COVID-19 and conducted this entire project remotely with myself in Philadelphia and Eli in Seattle. So to start, we looked at existing products exploring modularity, the idea of fast furniture, and Legos as conceptual inspiration. We utilized sketches and 1-6 scale models to further and actually inform our ideation. We thought about the different ways that the kit of parts could be used in living spaces and how the furniture could evolve. So after establishing a system of parts, we created a simple illustration style to communicate our designs. Our photo style actually leaned into the capabilities of CAD programs, embracing the fidelity that can be achieved through renders. With the images, we produced a shop website complete with working breakpoints and a purchase funnel. Mixed fidelity imagery informs the idea of maker culture. And the brand expanded around the idea of interlocking elements, as well as having the power to address the functionality of your own living space. Our social channel leans into the sustainable aspect of the brand through simple infographics and a slightly technical aesthetic. These choices were carried out through our brand collateral, including stationery, email notifications, and swag. All in all, the goal of our brand is getting people to rethink furniture by creating a product that can evolve and adapt to small spaces and changing situations. Rethinking solutions that result in less waste should always be part of the conversation. We want our product to help start conversations focused on consumer responsibility and encourage an individual's innate sense of creativity. And that was our project. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ian, and I'm with my teammates Claire and Ariel. Our senior capstone project is called Spectra. The question that we ask ourselves over the course of the project is how can we encourage open collaboration between creatives to empathize with diverse ideas and perspectives? 
Our approach was to create Spectra, a multimedia toolkit providing creatives within a platform to engage in guided introspection. The goal of the introspection platform is to enable creatives to better articulate their perspectives, and ultimately improving understanding within the collaboration. Spectra achieved this by organizing questions and experiences on the three core principles on the website. First, starting with discovery and exploration of self-value, then relating those values to others, and finally, encouraging collaboration and practice within the whole team. First, the homepage of Spectra onboards visitors into the introspection journey and principles. It starts with a broad introductory question, and as we move down, we give the definition of introspection, and then the guiding principles of Spectra. Next, we introduce the questions and experience modules. These are the main interactive content centered around open questions and topics organized under the three principles. Finally, we present options to explore the ecosystem of Spectra, including a mobile app and paper products. Diving more into the experience modules, these are to immerse visitors into a full page guided introspection session. In this case, the topic is centered around approaching team conflicts. In our research, we found that creatives benefit from externalizing their introspective thoughts. So this feature provides an overarching question series followed by specific writing prompts. Our vision in creating this is to provide a break from the solutionist mindset and think more about collaboration and self-awareness. The UI elements in this module disappear automatically when the mouse is idle to ensure a relaxing and focused session. When ready, creatives may click the next button and each question builds upon the previous one. At the end, they may share a link to the experience and give it to their team or personally revisit it later. Lastly, we included an explore page because we understand that although introspection takes time, we want to make it as quick and actionable for busy creatives as possible. And so the explore page allows for bite-sized interactions within the full toolkit. You can click on any question and experience and it allows for sharing as well. We made sure to include filtering so if you have something specific on your mind that day, you can find helpful introspection topics and resources right away. Currently, the main toolkit lives on the web, but how might Spectra live in various touch points? For example, Facebook promotion and course learning modules on LinkedIn, Instagram featuring daily introspection moments on social media, and Slack integration of the platform to embed in existing team communication channels. Since introspection can happen different places and times, we imagine a broader ecosystem outside the web, including a paired mobile app with personalized journal entries and favorites, also adding tactile physical products to help guide introspection on paper, like a journal and postcards. I've always been a dabbler, a musician, photographer, designer, writer. I'm constantly getting inspired by the work of others around me and always find myself experimenting and having the most fun the more I cross-pollinate with other creatives from different backgrounds. When I get real excited about a topic, I tend to ask a lot of questions. From my capstone, I wondered how I could channel this curiosity and foster a community around others who are similarly fascinated and inspired by hearing about other creative processes. I talked with creators from across disciplines, typographers, graffiti artists, musicians, architects, photographers, smell designers, celebrity hairstylists, balloon twisters, magicians, and more to see how they get their inspiration, work through creative blocks, and develop their ideas. Scatterbrain, is a space where these conversations and ideas are stored and shared. A collection of video, audio, interviews, IMs, and attachments. I wanted to create Scatterbrain to give myself a platform to fuel my curiosity. This is my playground to explore new mediums, practices, and industries and get a glimpse of the breadth of creative industries and processes that are out there. Scatterbrain is for conversations about creative process a space to unravel the method and the madness. Learning the twists, there's like 10 or so different twists. And all you gotta do now is look at something and say, what twists do I do use to make that certain object? And then you learn that, you learn that, you learn proportion, you learn how to control the air. And then afterwards you get so experienced, you remember things. And at that point it's just, you have to like, um, just work on proportion. What you mean in proportion? Proportion is if you make a, a, a uh, if you make a duck, right? You want a big head and a small body. You don't want a small head, big body. And then one arm is like five inches long and the other arm is so he looks like this. 
<laughs> so making sure your characters actually look like the characters that you're making. So people will say, can you make this character? And you're like, you want to do them justice. So you're not going to say, oh yeah, I can do that. And then you give it to them. And they're like, what is this? <laughs> Hey, I'm Maya. I'm Coco. And our project is called Mayo. Because Maya and Coco together makes Mayo, which started as us wanting to brand our studio together. But we wanted to design a product and pick up a few new skills along the way, including product photography and web design. So we took this name and combined two of our passions, which is beauty and branding, to create Mayo the skincare line. Because we're both half Japanese and the name of our brand is Mayo, we pulled visual inspiration from Kupi, a Japanese mayonnaise company. Their packaging has a bold red lid and a clear container which exposes the cream colored product inside, which makes Kupi Mayo super easy to recognize. We tie in mayonnaise into our brand by positioning the reference to food as clean beauty. We modified the baby used as the logo on the Kupi Mayo packaging to be the face of our brand. But the Kupi baby didn't originate from the Mayo company. It was originally a comic character created by female illustrator Rose O'Neill in the early 1900s. Kupi was genderless and was later used to promote women's suffrage. As two women in an adjacent field to O'Neill, this discovery felt like a validating serendipity. We scavenged our houses for empty product packaging and designed new packaging with our branding. As Maya mentioned, the packaging also took visual cues from QP. Because we were printing the product without the constraint of label size, we wrapped text around the bottom of each product. We gathered props from our houses that we thought would be appropriate for the brand and lugged them and our products to the photo studio in a giant suitcase. Because photography is a big part in what brings a brand to life, we decided to challenge ourselves as two people with very, very little experience with the camera. It definitely took us many more hours than we expected it to, and many all-nighters, but we had a lot of fun along the way. We then edited the photos, which, likewise, took much more time than we had expected. The website is where the majority of our brand exists and we would love for you to check it out. Like seriously, it was like a lot of work. This was also a research project on direct-to-consumer brands where we identified elements of a successful D2C brand and pulled them in the creation of our own. To find out more about that, our research is laid out on our about page of our website. We also wanted to give a quick shout out to Turnstyle, thank you so much for letting us use your printer. And to Parker for letting us use your photo studios. Uh, without access to the art building this quarter because of COVID, we really would not have been able to do this without you guys. So thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you everyone for watching. Bye. Hello, I'm Sarah Hastings. And for my capstone project, I worked with a mentor at Precore to create a product for at-home fitness. The two main places people work out is at the gym and in their homes. I began by learning about the benefits and limitations of each space. People love gyms because of their cardio and weight machines, which don't fit in most homes, as well as giving people a designated space to work out in where they're surrounded by others. The top two concerns with gyms are the cleanliness of the equipment and the facilities being overcrowded. What previously bothered people could now put people's lives at risk. On the flip side, working out from home can be a more convenient and comfortable option. But with the decrease in people's living spaces, it can be hard to get a good strength training workout in at home. My goal became to create a multi-functional piece of fitness furniture to help people get a gym quality workout in their homes. In surveying over 100 people, I identified three major trends. People want a product that saves space, they want to be motivated to work out, and they need accessible equipment to do so. Introducing Benchmark, both a piece of fitness equipment and a comfortable place to sit. Benchmark has three main parts, the bench, its equipment, and a partner app. The bench is adjustable and can be converted to a step. It has a cushion that doubles as a workout mat. The second part is the equipment. I created a versatile and simple weight system. The starter pack will include a set of six rubber coated plates, two dumbbells, one barbell, and a kettlebell attachment. 
Benchmark connects its users to custom training videos and resources via its fitness app. It allows the user to customize their strength training workout based on the equipment they have, and it gives them a space to connect with others and have accountability to help reach their goals. The videos can be viewed on multiple devices, such as an iPad or living room TV. This short animation shows how Benchmark works. The bench has a multi-angled adjustable seat that doubles as an easy access point to reach equipment. The bench can be easily removed from the base and then it can be lowered down by folding in the legs to be used for a step or hit workout. The cushion is removable and doubles as a mat, providing cushioning and sound absorption so your neighbors don't have to know when you're working out. The bottom drawer allows you to easily access your equipment. The cushion is made of a laminated cotton, which is easy to wipe down and can be thrown in the wash. After your workout, the bench can be returned to its normal position and used again as a seat. Benchmark motivates you to do a diverse and complete strength training workout from the comfort of your home. Thank you to everyone who helped make this project possible. Hi everyone, this is Bridget. Having always been inspired by creatives who produce faith-centered work, a branded and imaginary conference called His Word Found Here. So His Word Found Here is a three-day conference that explores the intersection of faith and creativity. Its main audience is young Christians who wish to express and strengthen their faith through creative acts. The event will take place in Joshua Tree, California. And the structure consists of man sessions, breakout sessions, creative workshops, and worship sessions. These are the guest speakers who come from a diverse creative background. And here are some of the topics that will be covered at the conference. The finalized lockup is made of a type component and a form component in order to visually convey the coming together of faith, which is something more concrete, and creativity, which is something more abstract. Recognizing that there are numerous ways to be creative, I expanded the lockup to seven more. This brand guideline showcases the main features of the system that I created. Now, I would like to take you through some brand applications based on when the audience will likely encounter each component of the whole experience. So before the event, one will see billboards, posters, banners about his word found here. And then the audience is directed to the website for more information leading to registration. One could also stumble upon the conference on Instagram and register through their phone. So during the event, one will first check in with their ticket and then receive a lanyard. They can pick up a catalog with information about all the programs. And from then on, they will go to the different sessions and workshops by their choice. And after the event, their free swags to take home with, toad, stickers, t-shirts, and bookmarks, etc. All right, that's all I have for today. Thank you so much for listening. Hi, I'm excited to present ARC, a collaborative experience. ARC is a collaborative installation between you and an AI, working together to generate a completely unique story. Let me introduce you, and then I'll explain a little bit more about my process. This quote is one of my favorites, and it's the first thing you see as you load in the experience. As I was exploring how stories are created and what story arc truly means, a mentor suggested I watch a talk from Kurt Vonnegut, where he explains how every story has a shape, a shape that can be plotted on a simple XY chart. In the end, he says, well, there is no reason why the simple shapes of stories can't be fed into computers. And I loved it. I sat there for a moment and truly thought about what he meant, what that might look like. With ARC, users are able to choose the shape of story they want to create, and the AI will generate an edit of existing film clips that follows that story. The system uses mood, 
is in the atmosphere and tone of a film clip to create a recontextualized film following the story arc chosen by you. As you hover over the different options, you can quickly see how your story might play out. When you click Generate, the AI will begin to study the shape, analyze the library of film clips it has stored, and start sorting and editing together a completely unique film. This project was 10 weeks of research, learning about AI, cinematic moods, systems, stories. It was an exploration, prototyping, there was training and testing, and then another round of training, which reached a 90% accuracy in building, compiling, animating, and finally, polishing. In the future, I look forward to adding support so that users can draw in their own shapes, choose their source material, and watch an infinite number of films created through collaboration between people and AI. AI is not simply a tool. It is not a single operator. It relies on inputs and information from people to train and give the system direction. Our input is the foundation on which AI learns. In an effort to highlight these systems and prompt conversation around future technology and the role of collaboration between people and tech, I created ARC. I'm really excited to see what you think. The project will be live this Friday for you to try for yourself. Look for ARC on the Design Show website, and please reach out if you have any questions or want to chat more. Thank you. Through my system 
Mr. Mother, take my body and wash me clean Been faithless, found you when I need it Do you still believe in me? Penny for my thoughts cost money Ready when the God come for me You can bet the odds are against us If living is an art, I'm the paper. Everything I love look different now Everything I was isn't in me now Still a sinner, no doubt But I'm better deep down So I wrote you this letter I hope you get it somehow To live and he got game But now I'm playing the vet Hall of Fame with the ring Say my name with the best You know I came for the rap Might have left with the check But better, better I invest And keep the family fed So I dance with the pen While the paper burning Feel like 1984 when the deck is turning 2020 vision couldn't save us A motivators How you getting greater when you're afraid of your neighbor The wrong Amazon burning The wrong ice melting Singing songs sometimes for slight selfish When I see the shit my people deal with I can only hope the music's healing Help the children kill the villain Penny for my thoughts cost money Ready when the God come for me You can bet the odds are against us If living is an art, I'm the paintbrush Hello everyone, this is our Capstone Project, Disclose. Our project explores our identities as three women of color coming from religious households. Through having conversations with one another on topics of race and ethnicity, religion, and gender, we were able to see how our identities and past experiences have played a central role in developing our sense of self. Disclose initially started off as a means for us to find similarities and differences between our experiences, and we ended up finding a sense of community with one another. In creating this space, we wanted to amplify our voices and experiences as women of color. By showcasing our conversations, we want others to be able to resonate with our experiences and recognize that they are not alone. And for those who may not directly relate to our experiences, we still hope that it can serve as a learning opportunity to provoke thought and gain a better understanding of other cultures. Our project exists as a live website. Our homepage introduces us as speakers and directs the user to our conversations. We wanted to put faces to our names in order to familiarize the user with us before delving into the content. Within each conversation, a different theme is discussed. Each of these conversations includes a unique illustration as well as an introduction and conclusion. Throughout the conversation, we showcase personal photos and definitions that directly relate to the text to provide more context and interactions. At the end of each page, the user can access other conversations through the secondary navigation. To accompany the text, the user can also choose to play audio of us reading along to immerse themselves in a more personal experience. In each conversation, we created different sections that exist as a sticky element to make the content digestible and easy to skim. We also included poll quotes throughout to highlight key moments in our discussions that help provide an overview of what is being disclosed. The about page highlights our motivations behind the project, as well as an overview on the tools we use to collaborate and make this project come to life. The detailed illustrations in each conversation reflect the vulnerable nature and depth of our discussions. Each highlights two key elements that capture the essence of our conversations. These elements, although clearly different from each other, are overlapped to showcase the interconnectivity that exists between our experiences. This illustration from our race and ethnicity conversation specifically highlights the textile patterns from our cultures. For our conversation on religion, we highlight our holy books, in this case, the Bible and the Quran. And for our conversation on gender, we illustrated a lace skirt to represent femininity and a kitchen towel to symbolize traditional gender roles. In the future, we hope to discuss these themes more in depth. Throughout our initial conversations, we found that there's still more to unpack and we've only begun to scratch the surface. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Mega, and this is Bridge. So the problem that I've been trying to tackle for the last few weeks is social media has become a vector for increased political polarization and toxic political discourse. It almost feels like we've forgotten how to talk to those that we don't agree with. So my design opportunity was how can we facilitate healthy dialogue amongst people with a variety of political perspectives? And my response is Bridge. And Bridge is a platform that exposes people to a wide range of political perspectives and enables them to discuss different topics with other users. So now going a little bit deeper into the platform. So Bridge is special because it redefines what it means to be a social media platform through a number of design decisions. First off, instead of having users aimlessly share content in a public manner, Bridge facilitates one-on-one -on -one conversations between people. Next, the way the algorithms are designed are essentially the opposite of current social media platforms. So instead of content being curated around what users want to see, content is curated to incrementally expose users to views different than their own. And finally, trolling is prevented by enforcing limitations on how much content can be published by a user every day. So unlike social media platforms we currently see, Bridge takes thoughtful steps to ensure that we can have healthy, productive dialogue between one another, even when we don't agree. So to learn more about this project, my other projects, or to reach out to me directly, you can follow the links below. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, thank you all for joining us today. My name is Cynthia. I am a senior major in Interaction Design. The project that I'm going to present today is a website called Facets. Facets is a website that tells a lucid story of the 2019 Hong Kong protests from different perspectives. I created this website because I find out through research that people who received information about the protests from both Chinese and Western media, they struggle to position themselves in this event. On one hand, after reading news from Western media, they emphasize with the protester for fighting against government oppression. On the other hand, they keep seeing negative parts of the protests from Chinese media. This brings up concern that the protests were getting overly violent. In addition, those who are from mainland China feel blamed and attacked by the protester just because of their identity. So to help my target audience process this conflicting information and better understand the protest, I created the website Facets. Facets takes the format of scrolling and storytelling. The audience will go through six sections of information as they scroll. Here you can see the first section. This introduction section presents a brief overview of the protest with small chunks of text paired with images. The second section is the timeline section. Here, the audience can scan through the important events of protests, and if they click into one of the events, a subsection will expand. Here, they will see a comparison of two news articles about the event, one from the Chinese media and one from the Western media. By offering additional context about the source of the article and highlighting the differences between the two articles, this comparison invites the audience to examine the information more critically. I included this binary comparison because this is where my audience confusion first originated, and they really have a chance to process the information side by side like this.
Following the comparison, there is a collection of other perspectives. This is to invite the audience to learn about other voices and help them find their own position. Following the timeline, there are three sections with statistical information. The section each talk about the scale of the protest, protest motivations, and the protesters' demographic information. Lastly, there is a section about my background, informing the audience that I'm originally from China and I study in the U.S. This allows the audience to be aware of the potential bias I might have as the dissenter, and beside, there is a section with citation links to learn more. From my website, I hope the audience can gain a better understanding of the protest. More importantly, I hope to encourage my audience to always learn about an event from different perspectives and critically examine the information they receive. Thank you all for listening. If you're interested in learning more, please visit our website or send me an email. Hello, we are Catherine Cheng and Yuan Tzu Li, industrial designers, and we present to you our capstone project, The Pandemic of Fake News, an exhibition that transforms media literacy education for young audiences. In our modern world, social media is deeply embedded in our lives. Of the 42 million teens in the United States, 95% have access to social media, and 54% use those online spaces to get their news. Digital media is rife with misinformation, and teens in middle school and high school are subject to the harm that may come from it. They face distrust in media forms, authority, and science. Polarization as a result of misinformation further drives people into their own echo chambers. And most of all, misinformation perpetuates violence against innocent people who fall prey to the tricks of disingenuous sources. Media literacy has never been more important. The Pandemic of Fake News is an exhibition experience that takes teens and their families on an eight-stage journey about media misinformation. Of the eight stages of the journey, today we would like to share with you three highlights. We want to show visitors the omnipresence of misinformation by bringing them into a corridor of screens that bombards visitors with an abundance of news articles, social media posts, and other forms of media misinformation. Meet Emily, Audrey, Drew, and Jack. These four teenage characters will armor our visitors with the necessary skills to become media literate. Visitors can learn about four different types of misinformation and the skills needed to detect them by working with these characters. Visitors will step up onto the map in order to initiate conversation with any of the four teens. In any given conversation, each character will walk the visitor through a misinformation scenario. Let's see what Emily has to offer. As you can see, Emily takes the visitor through a comprehensive example of false context. She vividly tells the story of how she used lateral reading to debunk a piece of misinformation that has gone viral on social media. When visitors finish their learning and reflections, they can create their own headlines at the photo booth that's designed to be a newsroom. Visitors are encouraged to wear the branded masks we provided at the beginning of the exhibition to pass on the important message we are the antibody to the pandemic of fake news. Would you like to become the antibody to the pandemic of fake news? Join us at the show and see the entire journey unfold. Hello, I'm Caitlin Hirata. Through a team comprised of myself, Peter Mock, Caitlin Haygood, and Kevin O, we have created our capstone, Seven Horns. For our capstone, we are motivated by the events currently happening in our society. Due to the pandemic, there was a rise in racism and hate against the Asian community. It was these events that inspired us to bring to light the spread of fear and how it is related to discrimination. In the last few weeks, we have also seen how our project touches beyond its original message and how it can be applied to today's political and social movements. With all of this in mind, we set out to create a video game that could tell the narrative we were compelled to share. With video games being interactive by nature, our research supported that they were a great way to create empathy and spark reflection within the player. We had one major struggle to overcome, though. None of us had ever made a game before. Taking our experience into consideration, we scoped for this capstone to be a playable demo of what would eventually become the full game. The premise is as follows. 
Over a seven-day period of living in lockdown, the player hears various news broadcasts that may alter their perception of their loved ones and reality. Without further ado, we'd like to present you a short trailer. We are excited to explore and develop Seven Horns in multiple ways, including transferring it to a stronger engine to allow for further polish and expanding upon interactions and elements. Lastly, we feel that Seven Horns is meant to tell a big story in a small package. Because of this, we want to dig deeper into its potential and reflect upon and echo today's acts of discrimination and the spread of fear. Thank you so much for tuning in to learn about Seven Horns. If you're curious and would like to learn more, we would love to get in touch. Nostalgia, a sentimental longing or wistful affection for the past. Nostalgia is an interesting problem space, but it's nebulous. How do we harness it? I started thinking about this idea of nostalgia while having to pack up my childhood home for a move. I saved everything, so seeing it all again was a flood of memories. I place a lot of value in my objects, and so does my mom. But my mom and I have struggled to communicate these memories to one another, so this time has been about learning to communicate. I've come to think of nostalgia as a joyous sorrow about times past. Happiness in an event that happened, but sadness that it's over. Throughout this preliminary research, I learned people wanted to remember together. I started to think about who I was designing for. One of my mentors reminded me of the quote, your childhood is not your own, it's your parents. And it's true, parents are very busy. They only have enough time in the day to live it, but not enough time to capture all those memories or even enjoy them afterwards. Parents read books to their children, but don't tell them stories about their lives. Sharing about our lives is important. I wanted my design to be sensory, but I was struggling to capture the sound of a laugh or the smell of the bath or the feel of their skin. As I worked through ideas, it was more about the experience of reliving memories than the senses themselves. I noticed the specificity of a memory, the date or the time, was an inhibitor to the imagination. It needed to be abstractly shared to be important. I kept moving forward, but I had to look back to my childhood for inspiration. I remember going on camping trips with my dad, looking up at the stars. We would tell stories, and the stars facilitated generational folk tales. It was about taking the time to be present, looking at something abstract. It let my imagination flow. So I introduce to you Evoke. It is a culmination of all of my research about nostalgia, the memories of my own childhood, and a desire to enhance the way we connect with our families. Evoke acts as a bedside journal, or rather a jar of memories. You tell it stories about your kids' lives and about your own. Each memory is captured as a star, saved abstractly with audio from the story and the digital files from your home photo network. Your stories are logged like stars in the night sky. Pick it up and take it with you to their rooms for storytelling at bedtime. Remove the wand and uncork the jar of memories as you let them spill out into your room. Looking up at the galaxy of your memories and lived experiences, each star acts like a cue. Picking a star feels like the magic of finding something you've lost and helps you to retrieve and retell the story. It aims to enhance the experience of sharing memories. Evoke connects parents and children through their stories. 
It gives them a chance to be present and thankful for their memories and less burdened by having to capture them. Instead, just retell and relive. This is Evoke. Hi everyone, my name is Nohea Putule. I'm a VCD senior and my capstone project goes by the name of Peach Fuzz. So early on in the quarter, I identified my passion for wanting to target the lack of progressive sex education that exists in our youth public schooling system. Curious to learn more, I sent out a survey and learned that the majority of people within my demographic were not raised in a household that openly discussed sex or puberty. I was really committed to creating a platform that broke that pattern. So I dove further into my research and learned that there is a large movement in the parenting world that addresses how vital it is to host these open conversations about sex and development at home. Learning more about transforming the talk into more of an open conversation, I learned that this progressive parenting strategy can result in healthier relationships within a home. It can create a sense of internalized confidence for a child. It can support a child to make wiser decisions as they develop into a sexually healthy adult. It allows for an accurate portrayal of sex and development to be present, and it breaks a pattern of feeling ashamed or embarrassed about the changes occurring in our bodies. With that knowledge, I designed a resource by the name of Peach Fuzz, which is a subscription box platform that aims to create an open dialogue between developing children and their families surrounding the topic of puberty and sexual development. Targeting both parents and children, it was really important to me that I identified the collaboration between these two very different demographics throughout all of my design decisions. So creating an environment of inclusivity, celebration, sex positivity, empathy, and support, I really wanted Peach Fuzz to feel like an attainable resource that served as a third party in a conversation. Going briefly into the brand guidelines, Peach Fuzz exists as a bold and uplifting brand that emphasizes a friendly and supportive nature. With a social media presence, it was really important to me to identify the contrast and bold graphics that would be branded towards a child while providing a supportive and more muted language in the wording and captions that could pertain to a parent. Briefly exploring the website, there was a strong intention behind telling a story rather than selling a product. Fitting the supportiveness that Peach Fuzz emphasizes in its ideals, I wanted that theme to come across in the branding language and storytelling approach within the web. Prioritizing an intention to support a new parenting ideal and shift in narrative rather than enticing a user to buy a product, the website has an educational and empathetic presence. Existing as a physical, tangible item was a clear opportunity for me throughout my design process as I learned to understand the value of a face-to-face -face conversation. Honoring the level of interactivity that can prompt a conversation, each box is equipped with a themed game or activity that can act as a third-party participant in a conversation between a child and their parent. Creating a brand that felt approachable for a child, yet digestible and trustworthy for a parent was a point of contact I made throughout all of my design decisions. Finally, understanding that this isn't an existing product, I hope that my project can contribute to the societal shift in narrative surrounding sexual development and puberty. These times of growth are nothing to be ashamed of, and I feel it is necessary to celebrate them. Thank you. The link to my portfolio and email are at the bottom of my page if you'd like to reach out to me. Hi there. I'm Eliza Townsend, and welcome to my capstone presentation. Today, I present Object Archive, the personal museum app an ongoing exploration of archiving the ordinary. How often do you find yourself in a situation like this? Here's an example of things I want to remember but don't necessarily want to keep. So what if there was a way to go from this to this? Objects recorded, indexed, and saved to my phone. Well, that's an example of how I got to here. Object Archive is an app that allows individuals to capture and catalog objects that are significant to them in their own personal museum. Using the same software as scan apps, individuals will be able to capture objects free of background clutter and allow them to exist just like they would on display. The app is comprised of three main states. First, a capture state in which individuals can photograph an object. Second, the feed. Here are all of the objects you have captured. They are shown in chronological order. Third is the collection state. Here objects appear in groups assigned by the individual. A collection could be a grouping of similar objects or objects from a specific time or place. As you can see from the diagram, an individual can swipe from right to left to, to toggle between states. From there, they can click into an object or a collection. Let's take a closer look. Tap on an object to see it closer up. This brings up the title, notes of significance, tags, and where the object is saved, as well as color ID and additional metadata. Press and hold to magnify. 
From the feed, swipe right to visit your museum collections. From here, one can tap into a group of objects. Capture an object by taking a photo. Under the circumstance that the background was not removed accurately, one can tap the brush tool to correct any part of the photo. Click the search icon on the home page to search or sort objects by toggling between time, color profile, or alphabetically. You might be wondering who would use this app. Well, here are some examples. The designer is working on a project, uses their personal museum app to collect artifacts to refer to for later. The teacher is teaching a cultural anthropology unit, wants to create an immersive project for students to participate in creating their own personal museum. The collector collects sneakers, wants a place to showcase their shoes. The explorer is documenting the local edible plants and uses their personal museum app to record their findings. I hope to be able to expand this project into a website as well. From the website, individuals will be able to order apparel and posters with selected collections or objects featured on them. Thank you so much for listening. Loose Lips is a collection of stories and perspectives unique to the experiences of having a vulva. Taking the form of a zine, Loose Lips provides information for individuals with vulvas, helping them familiarize with their own wants and needs and develop a healthy relationship with their bodies. Regardless of your identity, having a vulva comes with baggage. We started this project with the hope of creating an approachable space for these remarkable experiences to be shared. We are overjoyed by the community that has formed since the creation of this project. Over 450 participants lended their voices, illuminating that many people are uncomfortable with speaking openly about their genitalia. From those surveyed, many individuals expressed their discomfort and reluctance in acknowledging their genitalia. We found it staggering that over half of participants could not identify all or any parts of the vulva. That is why Loose Lips is a strong supporter for acknowledgement. In the back of the zine, a mirror will be included alongside steps that outline an approach to acknowledging your genitalia. We imagine that our zine is read within the comfort of one's own space. We created a visual motif for bed sheets for our cover. Our illustrations are slightly blurred with a grainy texture to support the purpose of the mirror, which is to provide clarity for subjects in a gray area. Our staple bound structure reveals what's between the legs with a climactic center spread. Mary created this abstracted illustration of a vulva to celebrate, acknowledge, and appreciate this part of our bodies. From this illustration, we focused on other key elements down to the page furniture to push everything towards the center gutter. We wanted to understand why many of us feel uneasy having conversations or sharing stories about gynecological anatomy and pleasure. It's important to challenge ourselves and others to feel comfortable talking about the uncomfortable especially given our current climate. This includes having conversations with partners, friends, and family. Even if these conversations may never become common at the dinner table, we can at least practice loosening our lips, asking questions, and begin to create an open dialogue between the legs. But I 
I'm trying to take you to the meadow But right now, you're stuck in the meadow <laughs> Guess that you can fall in love a little <laughs> Yeah, I know I'm there when we was kiddos <laughs> But I'm trying to take you to the meadow <laughs> Closed eyes, you in that floating I cry when my mind's open Way too high, now my sky's frozen Two lives don't mind my joking Crabbing my mind's open Way too high, now my sky's frozen Too last, don't mind my joking No tears for a monster No love for no beast Souls cry wild in the winter time Trying to find some peace No star shines bright now My grandma's quilt been passed down We've been gone for so long And on our own home Strange fruit grows right around here every season. Mm -hmm. I wanna tell my baby no fear. I don't believe it. Not around here. Cause every man wanted land to rule. Everybody's got a destiny, but nobody's free, nobody's free, nobody's free, from American dream, American dream. that day we let go of these chains American dreams American Dream! Hi there! We are a part of the Washington Hyperloop Club on campus, and today we are going to show you how we reimagined the travel experience through a new form of transportation, the Hyperloop. Now, before we get started, what is Hyperloop? It's a sealed tube with a passenger pod inside that can transport people at hypersonic speeds to their destination. Due to efficient energy usage and solar panels on the tubes, Hyperloop is expected to be carbon neutral. Most Hyperloop concepts that exist today mainly focus on a highly futuristic aesthetic with no regard to easing people's anxieties about riding on a new technology or its sustainable background. We wanted to change that. We designed a complete experience by solving traveler pain points uncovered by more than a month of in-depth user research, all through a more sustainable lens. We will only have time to show about half of our video, but you can find the whole thing on our websites and on the Design Show website going live on the 12th. We are both actively looking for jobs, so if you like what you see, please reach out. Without further ado, enjoy the teaser. Laura is juggling it all. She's raising her son, Christopher, on her own in Seattle, and she's commuting to her dream job in San Francisco every day. 
During her commute, Laura values feeling like a welcomed guest, reducing her carbon footprint, navigation through clear and personalized communication, and confidence through cleanliness. With Washington Hyperloop, Laura makes the impossible possible. The night before her commute, she opens up the Loop app to book a ticket. Seats are organized by social preference, with accommodations for single riders or for groups of up to four people sitting together. The app even suggests her favorite breakfast items, which will be ready for pickup at the Hyperloop portal. After payment, the interaction ends with a carbon savings reward, which adds up over time towards more travel perks. The next day, Laura commutes via light rail to the Hyperloop portal, where she scans her ticket to enter. The portal has two stories to clearly separate arrivals and departures. She can be more comfortable in the lounge above while keeping an eye on the boarding process below. Natural lighting reduces energy usage, while foliage and trees offer cleaner air, and both work together to create a relaxed and inviting atmosphere. Her pre-ordered oat milk latte and avocado toast are waiting for her at the pickup window. She subscribes to the cafe's cup subscription program, which helps her reduce her single-use waste. Hyperloop to San Francisco has arrived. Pod sterilization is currently in progress. Um, as graduating college seniors, we are currently facing the challenge of finding a home from a distance. So we see this as a great opportunity to explore the remote house hunting experience. Um, through research, we find that there is a lack of trust during the remote process, as there are many factors that are hard to look for remotely. People talk about everything could be different before I see the real thing, and I can, they can get a sense of the place when doing everything remotely. So we really wondered how might we enhance the house hunting experience and help renters trust the process remotely. So our solution was VTOR, which is a service that allows renters to find a person in the area, to be a viewer, and go in and check the place for them. Um, and through our research, we found that people have concerns regarding trusting a random person to represent them during the tour. And therefore, we came up with the following features um, in order to foster that trust. And you will see that in the next video. So this is VTOR and if you want to know more, check out this link below. Thanks for watching. Hi everyone, my name is Justin Tran and the name of my capstone is That What? An Honest Conversation About Adversity. 
To better understand my own adversity, I enlisted in three close friends to talk about how they handled their own hardships. I aim to capture the raw emotions associated with adversity and highlight people's stories so that others can empathize. I took three conversations and turned them into three publications. Each holds their own story and discusses three different topics about personal adversity. I found myself asking all quarter long, well, what even is adversity? I sent out a form to get some responses about what others thought about the subject. And of course, everyone interprets it differently, but essentially everyone had one thing in common, and I had to remind myself as well. Everyone holds their own story, and you never know what someone might say. Although these three conversations had three very different topics, the common thread between them was myself. I created these covers to show that, that there were differences between the talks, but also to show that there is common connection between them all. I used an AI tool to help transcribe the interviews, and at the end of the talks, it gave me a summary of keywords. I thought it was interesting to include the relationship between AI and these really real conversations. It was also fun to see and compare what were the commonalities and differences between all three different talks. Through this capstone, I was delightfully reminded about the power in sitting down and talking with your loved ones. There's something very special about sitting and just talking about a topic like adversity and being present in the moment. I think we can all practice our listening skills and provide a space for our friends to be vulnerable and reflect. So here's a little preview of some of the spreads to give you a better idea of how they looked across all three publications and the commonalities and differences that I pulled from each one. And one thing that I really wanted to highlight across these spreads were the power of words and to really have moments where text was really large. So here's a video of a flip through of one of the books and how I went about pacing and formatting and just the overall look and feel of the whole book. Moving forward, there's still so much more reflection to come and I still haven't fully digested all of the content and all of the words spoken in all of these conversations, but I'm just so excited to actually bind these and then once they're actually bound to flip through them myself and just relive the conversations. Thank you so much for listening. Hi everyone, thank you for coming today. I'm Sarah Tew and my teammates are Bridget Lewis and Sarah Strickler. Together we are Brave Expressions. Brave Expressions is a mental health storytelling platform that empowers people to express their experiences through any creative outlet. This project was born out of an opportunity we discovered that talking about mental health experiences is powerful in overcoming the stigma that surrounds mental health. However, there isn't a dedicated place where people can feel comfortable expressing their story. We started this process a little over a year ago by conducting about nine months of research over four rounds of interviews. We had separate goals for each round, and each round helped yield many insights that informed our future designs. When you first enter the site, you're greeted with a splash page with animations. We have a section that describes our mission, and then that leads into the story section where you can see stories of a variety of mediums that are submitted by real people. There are a wide range of mediums that can be used in stories, and this is one submission of a graphic novel detailing a person's experience during psychiatric hospitalization. People can see other recommended stories, like this piece of poetry. At the top of each story is an overview of what the story contains, and at the bottom is a short profile on the author. People can choose to be under the Brave Anonymous account if they do not wish to share their identity. Looking into how people submit their stories to us, we have created a full comprehensive page that gives a step-by-step -step guide on requirements, potential reflection questions, and a list of categories for stories. Once completed, people send us an email with their story and information. Next is the resource page. On this page, we show immediate help at the very top. Below, there are two different sections, general resources and resources by issue. Each section has more specific categories that drop down into a few resources that have descriptions of what they are and a link to their site. There are some additional business considerations that we have encountered. 
In an effort to populate our site for the launch and spread the word about Brave Expressions, we have conducted a lot of outreach to different groups and individuals. We have also created an Instagram to build social presence and continue to spread the word about our platform. We have been collaborating with the UW Entrepreneurial Law Clinic to gain advice into the ethical implications of sharing vulnerable stories online. We have recently filed our Articles of Incorporation and are now officially a nonprofit corporation. Our goal is to create a platform where people can express their mental health stories, learn about others' experiences, and know they're not alone. We aim to craft a community where people can experience a diverse range of stories and mediums and break down some of the stigma surrounding mental illness. You can explore more about Brave Expressions on our website and reach out via email if you would like to share a creative piece. Hi, I'm Casey, I'm in VCD, and my project title is Apple Juice. Apple Juice is an online and print platform that publishes a community-fueled magazine by women with type 1 diabetes for women with type 1 diabetes. Diabetes is an autoimmune disease where your body doesn't produce insulin. The effects are physical, mental, and emotional. I wanted to create a platform that harnessed the emotional and human element of having diabetes. No print platforms existed that encouraged slow and thoughtful reflection of having diabetes, and no platforms exist specifically for women with type 1 diabetes. I wanted to make a space that was intimate, personal, and safe for women to have honest conversations about their experiences. I started with designing the print magazine cover because it is the central element of apple juice. The juice box on the cover serves as a template for the magazine series, meaning each issue would show the same juice box with a different picture inside, previewing the contents of the issue. These spreads show example photo essays of women with type 1 diabetes. The content would be varied but housed within the apple juice graphics. You can see the straw in the box from the cover applied to a magazine section heading on the right. The swirly element you see on the left represents tubing from an insulin pump and appears as a reoccurring motif as well. Here's how the magazine would appear on the website. The website would have magazines, blog posts, merchandise shops, and it would be where people could submit to the magazine as well as discover upcoming events, which is what you can see here. Social media, of course, is an avenue for discovery and connection to other creators. Instagram would play a key role in promoting events and raising awareness about the presence of the magazine. What I'm showing you here is event flyers. These show how the illustration style would be expanded upon throughout the brand. I found that illustration as a central graphic element of Apple, Apple Juice kept it lighthearted and celebratory when talking about a topic that isn't so fun. Apple Juice is designed to take something that is ugly and challenging and make it into something that can empower and connect women over their experiences and in turn support and heal. All proceeds of the magazine will go to Type 1 International, an organization that helps provide Type 1 diabetics around the world with access to insulin and supplies that they need to live. Thank you to everyone for listening to, mo to my <clears throat> excuse me, um, presentation. Thanks to YouTube Design for the past three years um, and to my whole cohort. Um, feel free to reach out for any reason, and I hope you guys all have a great summer. Thank you. Hello, my name is Tureen Huang, and this is my capstone project entitled Chorus. The problem space I wanted to explore was that of music production, particularly for children around the ages of 9 to 13 interested in music production, how sounds layer and interact with one another in a musical piece. Typically for children, their options are either simple toys with singular instruments or preset melodies, or very complicated and intimidating professional tools that hinder exploration. So I asked myself, how might we design a tangible product that bridges the gap between toy and professional tool for children to explore music production? I wanted something that was tangible, customizable, and explorative. In early stages of concept development, this included looking at interesting interactions and spaces in which this product could exist. In refined ideation, I wanted something that was appealing, fun, and went back to the heart of making music. This led to Chorus, a set of modular instrument and effect blocks for music production, particularly geared towards children. This would function primarily through a loop sequence. A user would 
be able to use, say, a drum module to create a sequence of sounds that would repeat over and over, and then use another module, say, a piano, for another sequence that would layer on top of the existing drum one. Modules could then be added and then configured in different ways to create musical compositions of different kinds. In terms of color, material, and finish, I wanted something that was bright, playful, fun, and inviting to touch with textures such as silicone and rubber. Modules will be able to stack on top of one another as well as be magnetic when placed in close proximity. Audio outputs on the main module would include one such as a quarter inch for aux cords or headphones, as well as a half inch output for studio style headphones and speakers. From the side, cores can be seen to have very bright colors and the stacking modules make for a very compact nature. Users would be able to buy packs such as the basic purchase pack, which includes very foundational instruments, and then as skills develop, would be able to buy packs such as the audio effects purchase pack, or in the future, orchestral instruments or other instrumental packs to add to their collection. The following is a very simple animation as to how something like chorus could function. So thank you so much for listening to Chorus. Feel free to contact me if you have any questions or check out my portfolio website. Hi, my name is Daniel Neifert. I'm a member of VCD 2020. My capstone project is titled Bohr. Bohr is the name of the new music project created by myself and my brother Martin. Martin is a talented music producer that had not released a project under Unifying Identity, and this project sought to change that. We created an artist from the ground up culminating in the release of three singles, which are now available on all major streaming services. blends organic and synthetic elements through meticulous layering. I sampled imagery from across the web to create the brand, similar to how musicians sample sounds when creating music. I designed album artwork, posters, merchandise, a website landing page, and social media and streaming service profiles. For the website, I edited and adapted an existing sketch from open processing to fit the Bohr brand. This project will continue beyond the quarter. As Martin continues to make music, I will continue to design the identity. I encourage you to follow along with Bohr by streaming our music on Spotify, Apple Music, Google Play, or SoundCloud. We are on Instagram at bohr.organic and on the web at bohr.organic. Thank you. Hi all, my name is Jenna. I'm a VCD student and I'll be presenting my capstone, Vizia. Vizia is an accessible new way to stream music with an added visual layer. The desktop app pairs animated abstractions to match your mood and setting. Vizia is unique to other streaming services because it provides a new entry point for choosing music. Instead of finding an artist or album, users choose key mood words. From there, Vizia will suggest playlists based on your choice. This is a screen that shows an example of what you might see if you had selected Dreamy. 
my motivation behind this project was to connect two of my passions, art and music. I also found that there aren't any current sites that offer a visual and musical experience all at the same time. My vision for this platform is to be used as a tool that can be set up and then continue to play in the background. For example, leaving the animations playing on your bed while talking to friends or connected to a TV that you may leave on while having a dinner party. These are some examples of the types of visuals you may see while using the app. The idea is that the visuals will mimic the mood of your choice, whether that be happy, moody, playful, etc. The animations will continue to render and adapt as songs change. The style and tempo of the audio will dictate what you are seeing. Thank you for your time. If you'd like to see my full video, visit this Vimeo link. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. And thank you to alumni, friends, and family, and everyone who supported us. Bye!